Welcome to Leadership Lessons from the Fast Lane, brought to you by the Washington Speakers Bureau. In this space, we will explore some of the most pressing challenges that leaders face today with the world's most respected, innovative, curious, and accomplished thought leaders. We'd like to welcome our host, best-selling author and co-author of the recently published book, Choose Love, Not Fear, a WSB exclusive speaker for almost 30 years, Gary Heil. Hello, and welcome to Leadership Lessons from the Fast Lane. Our guest this morning is Secretary Madeleine Albright. Secretary Albright's many accomplishments include being a seven-time best-selling author, a professor at Georgetown, a successful entrepreneur, ambassador to the United Nations, recipient of the Medal of Freedom, and the 64th Secretary of State of the United States. Good morning, Madam Secretary. Welcome. Thanks for sharing some time with us. Good morning. Good to be with you. Thank you. Oh, it's great to be with you. Hey, I love the book. Great. Absolutely love the book. Uh, a memoir, yes. Great stories, yes. But for me, uh, even more importantly for me, it was a leadership tone. On every page, I found myself underlining leadership issues, thinking about blogs I, used, I need to write. Congratulations. Really loved it. But I got to know about the title. Hell and Other Destinations. Is this something I might have read on a Starbucks cup? Yeah, you got it. You know, it's the single most famous thing I ever said was that there was a special place in hell for women who didn't help each other. Uh, and therefore, we did need to help each other and find other destinations. It didn't, I wrote the book before the current pandemic, um, and I didn't realize how germane the title uh, is now with a different meaning. You know, it was great. And you know, on nearly every page in the book, there was a description of a leader who had a very defined sense of purpose that was emotionally engaging. As I read it and I thought about the one example, given what we're in today, of the team you were on that built a collaborative sense of purpose with Merck and the Gates Foundation to address AIDS issues around the world. I began to think about the world we're in today, socially distancing with COVID-19. And I was wondering if we're in as good a place today as we were 10 years ago. Do we have that sense of purpose globally? I mean, it seems to me the United States doesn't lead the Western world today in the same way. Europe seems fractionalized. China seems to be moving in the other direction. Are we challenged today on the global leadership stage to solve big problems like COVID-19? Uh, I think we are challenged on the world stage, but it is of our own making. And I so believe in American leadership, um, which is not American dominance. It's more about American partnership with other countries to try to affect the various problems that are out there. Uh, and we clearly have them and the virus knows no borders. So more than ever, uh, we need to have partnership and so I do think it's the absence of American leadership at the moment uh, that I think uh, creates a lot of the difficulties that we're in. And as I said, it's of our own making. And it probably will slow us down a little bit, won't it, coming out of this pandemic? Well, I think it will, because there is a, first of all, there's a denial about the fact that for America to be America, it needs partners. Uh, and needs to operate with others. Uh, and even though it's the responsibility of every president of the United States to protect our people, our territory, and our way of life, uh, it can't be interpreted uh, by absenting ourselves from the international system and building walls and not understanding the interconnectedness of the 21st century. So I do think we're kind of behind the eight ball at the moment. Um, and I do think we need to figure out how we try to solve some of these problems because as I say, uh, the virus knows no borders, uh, climate change knows no borders, um, and some of the other issues that are out there now on, on nuclear uh, proliferation. So it doesn't take a genius to figure out that we need to uh, cooperate with others. Probably applies internal to our, internally to our country too, right? I mean, I was watching the news last night and as I watched the news, I began to think we had a red virus and a blue virus. In the United States, the common sense of purpose 
country, service, duty. I'm wondering if it hasn't been replaced in recent years too many times by loyalty to party or self-loyalty. What am I going to get from it? Am I off on that? No, I don't think you're off. And I think that, well, there are divisions in every country, and we know that. And the question is whether you have a leader who tries to find commonality and some way of, of uh, people who disagree working with each other, or finding the opposite, which is to try to exacerbate the divides and one blame the other. And um, you were talking about my most recent book, but the book that I wrote before that, Fascism, A Warning, I wanted to figure out what was going on and how fascists got started. And it, as you know, began in Italy with Mussolini. Clearly, there were divisions in Italy. They had fought in World War I on the Allied side, but it had not been recognized for their activity. There were economic problems, and Mussolini <clears throat> comes out uh, from nowhere, really, an outsider <clears throat> who was a uh, very good speaker, uh, was able to mobilize people, and in fact, did do uh, what I talk about in terms of fascism as a process for gaining power by identifying with one group at the expense of another. And so I think that's one of the things that's happened in the U.S. is kind of the exacerbation of divisions so that you're talking about a red and blue virus. Boy, that must make it tough in a way long term to be thinking about how do we attract young people to service um, as the kind of commitment you've made throughout your whole life to our, to our country. How do we attract young people to service when we're that divided? Well, it, I'm glad you asked that because one of the things that I enjoy most about what I'm doing today is teaching at Georgetown University and uh, spending time with young people. And, uh, you know, I'm often asked whether I'm an optimist or a pessimist. I'm an optimist who worries a lot. I'm an optimist because of the young people. And I find very interesting um, their uh, real determination to try to figure out what's going on, how it happened, uh, and what they can do. And a lot of them already are involved in some kind of community service. And, and they eschew, I think, the, um, the political divisions, at least from what I've seen recently. And what they want to do is to participate, but they need to figure out what they can do and not kind of be uh, dismissed in terms of, oh, well, they're too young and they don't understand it. Do you find the Generation Z and the millennials very different than the rest of us are more in reputation than actual differences? Well, I, I do find a difference. They actually know what to do with technology. Um, they are very comfortable with it. And I think what's very, I, I kind of been examining my own thoughts about uh, you know, my grandchildren, basically, which is being critical of them for always being online um, or not understanding the importance of privacy. The truth is they're way ahead of us because they do know what to do. And when somebody says to them, unmute yourself or uh, let me know what, uh, what technique you're using, they can answer it. Um, and they are, are very good, I think, at thinking out. I think they are obviously, for good reason, troubled at the moment because many of those in college had a plan uh, and they were set up for summer internships or then trying to figure out what they would do after graduation and they have been um, thrown a really very bad uh, message by the fact that uh, we don't quite know where things have come from. We're very good at blaming somebody else instead of what I think we all try to teach the younger people is to take responsibility. So. I do, my hope is for them. Yeah, I found that they really have a great commitment in some ways to a cause if they find a cause, but they sort of have a BS meter that doesn't allow them to be tricked very easily. I think that's true. <laughs> hey, I, it's 2020 and I'd be remiss in talking about global leadership and national leadership if I didn't ask you about the election. I noticed in the book that you say that elections turn on the economy and national security issues usually but I'm guessing that COVID-19 and the pandemic are not going away before November. How do you think this election will be different? 
Well, I do think uh, the uh, pandemic is going to play a major role, and there will be, um, I believe, some judgment as to how uh, it has been dealt with in so many ways by the leadership. And I think more of a, uh, an understanding specifically of the American system. Um, a lot of people, uh, you know, they know about the Constitution and they certainly know about the, uh, the way that the Constitution has been written with um, power to three branches of government. And by the way, the Article I is about the power of Congress. Uh, and then Article Two is about the power of the executive branch. But then also the whole question about the role of the states um, and what the role of the governors are. And then also, what are the roles of local uh, uh, government organizations and community organizations? And, and I, I, because I do try to find a silver lining in things, I think that uh, there will be more of a recognition of the various levels of power uh, where to, to whom to speak about doing something, and then having a judgment about what has not been done or been done wrong at different levels. But it's going to require, as in every uh, election, uh, discussions and uh, the candidates at all those levels talking to their constituents and, and, and pushing in order to uh, determine what has happened and what needs to happen to solve what is a genuinely horrible um, crisis in so many ways. If you had one piece of advice, it's January 2021, a new president takes office. One piece of advice, what one thing would you change? Well, uh, certainly the leader, but what I also <laughs> uh, would do is to make sure that the leader spends time talking to the people. Um, in whatever method, not um, uh, acerbic press conferences, but I think in terms of messages of a variety kind. So some of it very specifically spoken, but other, I think, has to do with behavior, um, respect for the executive branch, for the legislative branch, uh, which I must say, I mean, it's no secret who I think should be president, but uh, a President Biden had also been a Senator Biden uh, and understands the executive legislative relationship and the behavior towards it and the judicial branch. So it's not just a matter of what one says, but how one behaves. And so I would expect that there needs to be and will be a different form of behavior in terms of making clear that, we, that the new president understands what democracy is about. In your book, I love the one chapter titled, Don't Get Angry. It seems to me my interpretation of your leadership lesson in that chapter was, when we get feedback where that it's not necessarily comfortable, we should invite it, not fight it. But I'd love to hear your take on it because I thought it was intriguing. Well, I, I really do think uh, let me say there are moments when anger can be a tool, but not as a constant aspect of it in terms of, you know, here comes somebody that's going to always uh, be angry about things and not, uh, which to a great extent may mean that you are not acting rationally. Um, and so I think that being angry is kind of a cheap tool, frankly. Uh, and I think that it's more important uh, to try to figure out what uh, those that you with whom you're angry, what they really want, is there anything rational in what they are talking about, and to try to put yourself into the other person's shoes and figure out how to solve a problem. I, I do think that anger, uh, in many ways, um, exacerbates the issue, does what we were talking about earlier, the divisions, uh, and that uh, it is not something that is useful. Now, I must admit, there were times where um, there's one thing about deliberate anger, uh, where you think, okay, I've had it, and so you tell it like it is. But mostly, uh, anger that comes from just an emotional reaction to things is not useful. There's a corollary to that, right? Uh, and that is, is that as a leader, we're trying to invite that critical feedback and the conflict that basically is necessity for creative solutions. But there's the other side, which is the follower, where I owe the leader to speak truth to power. 
you describe in your book once sitting around the table with the president of the United States watching everybody fail to say, say it straight. Can I, I try to find some other way of saying it? But if you don't say it straight, it comes out a little crooked. And everybody had a little trouble speaking up to the president. Well, I think there are a couple of things to this. First of all, the decision-making process in a democracy is set up in order to find out um, in the executive branch um, what the various departments believe, what their uh, uh, recommendations are for dealing with a particular problem. Um, and it is absolutely essential to get the different views out because, uh, I mean, there's no way that various departments and, and cabinet secretaries are going to agree about everything. And that's the whole point. In a democracy, you want to hear the different points of view. You do try in the American system, I always talk about it this way, is that a really good national security advisor has to break the eggs and get um, each cabinet secretary to say what he or she, she thinks, and then try to make an omelet out of it to give to the president. <laughs> If you can't make an omelet, you take the egg mess and give it to the president, and then you're supposed to argue your point rationally in front of the president. Now, in order to do that, you have to get a sense of how the president operates, what he likes, uh, and does he welcome the truth to power. It's not simple to do, believe me. I do think that, um, and I've tried to describe to people it's awesome and awe-inspiring to walk into the Oval Office. And, you know, unless you're an, a, a, a historical ignoramus, you, don't, you know how much has happened in that office and who has sat behind that desk. And so there is a certain um, awe-inspiring aspect about it. But then you remember what your job is, and you're supposed to say what you think and then be able to answer the questions of the president. The hard part, and I experienced this myself, is when some of your colleagues kind of um, are condescending towards what you've said, um, and so then you have to argue more strongly, and you don't want to go and start getting angry in front of the president. So there, but an awful lot, and I can't stress this enough, is the behavior of the president. Uh, and I know, for instance, that President Clinton actually really... Uh, I, I would say loved it when we uh, were arguing with each other. He would often um, ask very pointed questions to elicit some of the differences because he was the one that learned, uh, who liked being told what the facts were. Um, and it was, it was very interesting to, to operate that way. But you do need to have a sense that the president um, and your colleagues are counting on you to explain what you're for. It takes courage, though. Certain amount. It also takes, and this is the part that I say, you got to know what you're talking about. There can't be a lot of BS. I think there really, you do need to have your facts straight, and you need to know what the views of the others in the room actually are, uh, even before they say them, so that you're kind of prepared for uh, what is going to happen. You know, by the way, one of the things, when I teach at Georgetown, I always have a role, a game simulation, and one of them is of what it's like to be in the principles committee, which is the decision-making body for the National Security Council. And I tell my students ahead of time when we assign the roles kind of two months before they even, the role, it's, the game itself comes up, to get to know what the other people think, to know where they're coming from, and to be able to uh, set up rational arguments to um, dispel what they're thinking or persuade them or, or maybe be persuaded by them if they actually have some ideas that can be melded into the ones that you believe in. The courage it takes to do it. I, I love the fact that courage can be overcome sometimes when you realize something else is more important, as Nelson Mandela said, right? You've had some experiences that the rest of us can only wonder about. Taking tough feedback to somebody like Putin or Milosevic or Kim Jong-un, is there anything you can tell us about providing tough feedback to people like that in the world? That's got to be a different experience. Well, it is different, and it's, um, but it's also absolutely necessary. But 
to go back on a theme that I've now mentioned a number of times, it's really important to know uh, who the person is that you're talking to. Uh, what are, uh, I, I have often talked about the role of the individual in national security policy is understanding where the pe person is coming from. Everybody has a history um, and the intelligence that you're provided by the intelligence community often doesn't have uh, black and white answers. Um, there are a variety of scenarios and various things and, it's, and you bring your own kind of Rorschach test to it when you see it but you really do need to know who you're dealing with. And in the case of the people that you're talking about, I happen to have known probably the most about Milosevic. And it's one of the accidents of history, uh, of which there are many in my life, was um, my father was the Czechoslovak ambassador to Yugoslavia immediately after the war. Um, and so uh, I always say my, one of my first jobs as a little girl uh, I was the little girl in the national costume that gave flowers at the airport to people. But what happened was, as a result of living there, I actually understand Serbian. Um, and I also understand a lot about uh, now the former Yugoslavia. Um, and so there I am with this man that I know his history, how he has exacerbated the problems with hypernationalism, um, and has made up a lot of facts. And I listen for a while, and he keeps telling me that I don't understand the Serbs and that my father loved the Serbs, and I finally had it, and I said, I know the Serbs, and I know my father loved the Serbs, but not what you're doing now. Uh, and so I think at a certain point, you do have to tell it like it is, but in a firm voice and not hysterical. I think that's an important part. It was a little harder with Kim Chong-il, the father of the current leader, because we didn't have a lot of information about him. And so uh, I had heard that he was crazy and a pervert. Uh, I found out he wasn't crazy. And so we had a lot of very interesting discussions. Uh, he knew a lot of facts. Uh, he did not turn to his advisors for every, um, sci every uh, a really technical aspect about missile limits that we were talking about. Um, but then I also watched him as he was trying to um, uh, be a good host. It was very, it was interesting in terms of things, but I, I certainly uh, said what I meant and he knew it. And so I don't think it's bad to have kind of a mixture of um, putting yourself into the other person's shoes, using basic uh, politeness uh, and good manners, but at the same time understanding why you are meeting with a particular person, and what is the message you're supposed to deliver? Were there certain advantages to these conversations that you had, or disadvantages, that you were the first female Secretary of State in U.S. history? I think uh, probably both, frankly. I think the thing, just so you know, I had been ambassador to the U.N. and a cabinet member, and what happened was that um, Secretary Christopher had made clear that he wasn't going to stay for the another term. And so it was the period of the great mentioning. Uh, and so my name came up. And what happened, somebody said uh, that no woman could ever be Secretary of State because Arab leaders would not deal with a woman. But I had spent four years at the UN and spent a lot of time with Arab ambassadors. And they um, got together and they said, we've had no problems dealing with Ambassador Albright we wouldn't have any problem dealing with Secretary Albright. Um, I then, then somebody at the White House, and I never want to know who, said, yeah, Madeline's on the list, but she's second tier. Uh, the issue is that I didn't have any problem with foreign leaders as a woman. I arrived in a very large plane that said United States of America, and they knew that if they were going to deal with uh, a diplomat, it was going to be me to, to do that. Frankly, and I'm sorry to say this, I had more problems with some of the men in our own government. And partially because I would known them for too long. They had known me um, as, as somebody that had them over for dinner, which I had um, you know, helped them with their plates, or uh, somebody that was a good friend of their wife's, or uh, had made coffee uh, when I was a staffer on the Hill. And they thought, how did she get to be Secretary of State when I should be Secretary of State? I do think that there are some advantages to being a woman, um, and uh, some of it had to do with kind of 
uh, being able, I, I couldn't go into a meeting with a diplomat, which is what men do and say, I like your tie. So we were talking about, you know, the country and various other things. And then finally, I, since I had a mission when I went there, I would say, I have come a long way, so I must be frank. Uh, and I did find companionship and support from other, when I was at the UN, from other women ambassadors, and when I was secretary from some of the women foreign ministers. In studying leadership for most of my adult life, I've come to the conclusion, rightly or wrongly, that although it can be more difficult for women at times, but women have somewhat of a natural advantage in leading from many of the women I've met. Would you agree with that? Well, I would. And it's very interesting that you asked that because <clears throat> recently I have been asked about how the fact that there are a number of countries, <clears throat> the countries that have, are run by women are the ones now that have been able to deal with the virus. Um, and it begins with New Zealand and Taiwan and Finland and Germany, uh, Denmark, um, Norway, Iceland. It's very interesting, all run by women. And <clears throat> so I've been asked, kind of from that perspective, how come? And I think part of it is that women in coming to power uh, do it by being friendly and nice to people and showing <clears throat> that they are dependable uh, and that um, can be counted on. So that's one thing. The other, I think, is that women, <clears throat> I do think men and women think somewhat differently and women are better at multitasking, mainly because that's something that we are by necessity have to do. I think men may be better at kind of deep thinking about one particular subject. Both those are generalizations, but it's um, one that I think is useful for this because the multitasking allows women to have peripheral vision in terms of what the unintended consequences of the virus might have been. Then I think also uh, something that works is that women um, are caretakers in many ways. And they don't want their children to fight with each other. And so instead of pitting one group against another, they try to find some kind of a common purpose. Um, and, and actually women are pretty good about decision-making. So I do think there's some things that work. I happen, however, to believe that the best combination are men and women working together uh, and trying to sort out how to operate. And I think one of the most important parts about leadership for me it is literally teamwork, that there isn't anybody, no matter how powerful uh, he or she thinks they are, uh, I think uh, it takes uh, listening to people and also teamwork and understanding that um, you don't have to take credit for everything, uh, that it is Im important to get views from others. Speaking about teamwork or lack thereof, it in your book, you depict a scenario that I thought you and I sort of had some commonality to when you had the decision to make to join the New York Stock Exchange board. <laughs> and you got to see firsthand the good, the bad, and the ugly of not so independent directors. I, um, You were depicting your story about how a in those days, I believe the New York Stock Exchange was a not-for-profit organization that had suggested to you that its CEO get a $187 million pay package. I wonder what lessons you learned from serving on that board. Well, I, I did. Well, first of all, um, I, it wasn't just the, the negative lessons, but it really was something about my desire when asked to, to do something. Uh, willing to explore and try to figure out what it was about. And I think the lesson that I should have learned is that I didn't read some of the early signals uh, more clearly in terms of <clears throat> having been uh, suggested to be on the board that Dick Grasso, who was the president, said to me, uh, well, my Democratic slots are filled, which I thought was kind of weird for what was supposed to be uh, that kind of a board. <clears throat> and then there began to be stories about how much money he made. And all of a sudden, I got a phone call saying uh, he changed his mind and he thought that I should be on the board, at, at which point I decided to call uh, Senator Paul Sarbanes, who had been somebody that really had looked at uh, <clears throat> the boards and a variety of financial issues carefully. And he did say to me, 
that it would be a good continuation of my public service. Uh, I did learn a lot, but I also do think that it was, for me, uh, interesting in terms of sometimes following my gut, because I remember one of the questions that came up uh, was, should there be a, a fast price or a fair price? And I decided it should be a fair price, and I think I was right about that. And also that the sums of money that people talked about didn't make any sense to me. But I do think that I also do have, from my various other experiences, a sense of the public reaction to certain decisions. And I thought that there was a uh, stunning blindness uh, to that by um, Grasso himself and a, some of the other board members. But it sure was a lesson. And I decided that it was worth writing about it because uh, my, dis my uh, response about going on the board in the first place was done out of a sense of uh, wanting to learn something new, but also having a responsibility about things and that sometimes um, you make the wrong choice and then you have to figure out uh, what, what are the unintended consequences of it. And some of this actually turned out, some of the unintended consequences were positive because they taught me a lesson. It taught me a lesson just remembering it when I was reading your recount of it. I do note that just a few years ago, many years after it happened, that Dick Grasso wrote about it. He's still not very happy about you speaking truth to power. Oh, definitely not. <laughs> to count yourself by who doesn't like you. I, have to, I, I do like to be liked, but sometimes it may be better that some people don't like um, what you have done, and it may be worth it. True there. By the way, I loved your interview last week with Trevor Noah. <laughs> and um, I, I just absolutely loved it. And I love the line you said to him at the end that I just had, to, I want to explore it with you. You said, humor is an important part of diplomacy. And I know you gave him an award, but I'm dying to know more about that. Well, I'll tell you what is interesting. First of all, um, I, I have enjoyed uh, watching him and I had met him um, at a, some meeting and I thought he was very smart and, and an interesting person. And the award actually um, is, I'm chairman of the board of the National Democratic Institute. One of my very appropriate passions is uh, supporting democracy. And we were trying to figure out, we always give our democracy award to somebody. Um, and it was very interesting. The year before we'd given it to Jose Andreas, who uh, has been feeding people. And one of my statements had always been is that you know, there's the issue about uh, whether political or economic development comes first, and I'd say they go together because democracy has to deliver because people want to vote and eat. But we decided to give the Democracy Award to, to Trevor Noah because he has a fascinating background, I think, in terms of his South African life. And he's a very serious person, despite the fact that he can put humor and laughter into things. And so we decided that it was very important for diplomacy and democracy to have um, a, an understanding and to inject uh, happiness and laughter into it. And he was perfect. He gave a terrific talk and he's really a remarkable person. So I was very pleased to be on the show. And, and, it, and it was great. It was, it, was, it was informative and great entertainment. You know, one of the stories that I'm telling everybody in your book I'm saying you've got to read this. It's a story about you in a naturalization uh, service where you're swearing in a group of new citizens. Do you know the story I'm talking about? I do. Um, let me just say, <clears throat> for people who don't know this, <clears throat> I am a naturalized citizen and a very proud one. I was 11 years old <clears throat> when I came to the United States. And so uh, I uh, always describe myself as a grateful American. So what happened was, on July 4th, 2000, um, I was Secretary of State, and um, I was uh, asked to come to Monticello, the home of Thomas Jefferson, uh, to a naturalization ceremony. And I figured since I had his job, I could actually give out naturalization certificates. And so I hand this man his naturalization certificate, and he walks away, and I hear him saying to somebody, can you believe it? I'm a refugee and I just got my naturalization certificate from the Secretary of State. And I said, can you, I go up to him and I say, can you believe that the Secretary of State is a refugee? And I think 
uh, that is the amazing thing about this country and that refugees come here um, because they want to contribute. I think most people would prefer to live in the country where they were born, but if they can't because it's dangerous or they can't have a life, um, this country has been welcoming to those of us that want to come here. Uh, and I think, uh, I hope that people believe that those of us that have come have given back uh, and that we are proud to be Americans and that um, closing our borders does not work. And I have also been saying that at this time, the Statue of Liberty is weeping. Immigration certainly have been a big part of our past and a big part of our future. Is it really so impossible to solve these days as it seems politically? Isn't there just a common sense solution to the immigration issues in our country? Um, I think there is. I think there needs to be a comprehensive immigration bill. By the way, every country does have the right to make laws about who it lets in. I mean, that is something that is a part of sovereignty. But I also think that it's important to understand um, who and why they want to come into this country, to set up a system um, that allows people to uh, come in legally um, in a process that is fair, uh, that is open, um, and that does have the support of, of people and not kind of make it impossible or do the kinds of things that are going on now of separating children from their parents and putting them in cages and pushing people to go back into situations that don't work. And <clears throat> for instance, uh, a group that um, I identify myself with, though I certainly was older, um, is I didn't make the decision to come to the United States. My parents did. And there are these young people that were brought to this country by their parents who have been raised American that want to be able to stay. Uh, and so I do think it's important to understand. I so remember, uh, I didn't become a citizen until I was uh, between my sophomore and junior year in college and studying for the uh, questioning that came up and being very proud to take the oath. And so I do think uh, I have such a sense of the importance of becoming an American. It is possible to do it by law, uh, and I do hope that there will be a comprehensive immigration act. The other thing that jumps off the page in your book is your curiosity. It seems unending. What are you reading these days? Well, I have um, just been reading a really incredible book it's called The Beekeepers of Aleppo, <clears throat> which is written by a woman who writes about the immigrant experience of people escaping from Syria. Really quite an incredible story. And then I have just been finishing Lynn Olson's book about Madame Picard, who had been a, uh, a, <clears throat> a woman, the first time a woman ran an intelligence a, a spying operation in France during World War II. Wow. Curiosity, have you found when in leading in the State Department or even in your business that you started, have you found that as a leader it's important to stay curious and to help others stay curious? It seems to me sometimes curiosity sort of dies a little bit as we get older. Um, I do think it's important to be curious because there is always so much more to be learned. And I do think that uh, I always, in, first of all, if people ask me what I really miss about being Secretary of State, it's the intelligence that I got of reading. Um, when I'd come into the office in the morning, I will, would have read five newspapers, and then there was a packet on my desk, which was a pamphlet from the intelligence and research part of the State Department of the things that had happened overnight. And then somebody from the CIA would come in and give me a lot of information. And then I wanted to ask questions and have discussions about it. And then I very much, I, I was a bureaucratic disaster, by the way, because I liked <laughs> the desk officers that really were doing a lot of the work and finding out a lot more about what was going on in X country and being curious. And, and that has been really my way of operating, of really thinking through what I could learn more. And I have learned so much since I left office, which is one of the reasons I wanted to write this book was to show the various things that I've done, what were new. My business certainly was new. Uh, teaching wasn't, but 
kind of looking at different areas of things in terms of things that I didn't know and pushing myself uh, to learn new things. I think it is uh, something that is energizing and certainly makes me feel younger um, than I actually am. Two leaders, living or dead, who most influenced your thinking or you most admire? Well, um, I am going to say the obvious, which is my father uh, and my mother. But my father, because he had been a professor and, uh, and a diplomat and was very strict father, um, and all we ever talked about was foreign policy. Um, I think that was the, the most important aspect. Um, and so, very much so. And then I have to say that two people uh, that uh, had, in fact, influenced me a lot, um, they are unfortunately both dead, is Nelson Mandela and Václav Havel. They were people who understand, understood the importance of leadership and governance. And then the part that I thought was so important was that they were able to forgive their jailers and were, <clears throat> were looking forward an awful lot. I have to say, I used to say there were three of them, and I added Aung San Suu Kyi, but I am very disappointed in her behavior now, um, and so I don't put her on the list anymore. Um, and uh, and I, I do think that um, I have very high admiration for the former presidents of the United States. Uh, I have studied what they have done. I haven't always agreed with them. Uh, but I have great admiration for the former presidents of the United States. One piece of advice, Madam Secretary, for a young Gen Z or millennial leader making their way up in through their life and aspiring to create a change in the world to make tomorrow better than yesterday, one piece of advice, just one you would give them that might shorten their trails. Well, I think, first of all, that you can't plan your steps. You cannot do that. You never know where things lead. But I do think what is absolutely essential is to, when you are asked to do something, to do it, to be dependable, uh, to be somebody that is a good team player, um, but to finish what you have started and uh, to not think that things are beneath you. Uh, I think a mistake is, to really always think you know where you're going to end up. It never occurred to me on any part of my life uh, that I would have the kind of positions that I've had and the things that I'm doing now. But I think people would say she's dependable. She will do what she's asked to do, even if it is making coffee and Xeroxing. Uh, and she will, in fact, finish the memo that she was asked to write. So two other quick questions, Madam Secretary. Um, one is, people may not realize your aspiring career as an actress. <laughs> Imagine my surprise watching Madam Secretary one day when Madam Secretary shows up on Madam Secretary. Well, your favorite show. Well, let me just say, I think people don't realize, and I'm not sure I realized it myself, is how much I enjoy <clears throat> having fun and doing something different. and. And, uh, and surprising people. <clears throat> so my, I have to give you the history of this a little bit. I do watch television. Um, and so I watched a show called The Gilmore Girls, which was about a mother-daughter <clears throat> relationship. And so all of a sudden, I'm out of office, and I get a call from the producers saying, would, they mind, would I mind if I, somebody played me on Gilmore Girls? And I said, yes, I mind. I want to play myself. Mm -hmm. So I did that. Then I was asked to be on Parks and Recreation. Um, and I had fun doing that with Amy Poehler. Uh, and then what happens is all of a sudden I get a call <clears throat> from the producers of Madam Secretary with <clears throat> Taya Leone wanted to talk to me about what it was like to be Secretary of State. <clears throat> and so we had this conversation and I thought, gosh, I'm having this serious conversation with this actress about being Secretary of State. Uh, what is that all about? <clears throat> so then, they asked me to be on the show. And I think many people have heard about the White House Correspondents' Dinner. <clears throat> and so I, uh, the producers asked me to come with them. And I'm in the line with Taya Leone. And somebody would say, Madam Secretary, and she would turn around. So <laughs> what happened was uh, <clears throat> last year, um, they wanted to have um, Hillary Clinton and Colin Powell and me on the show. 
um, all of us together, and we agreed. And um, the whole uh, script, it was all scripted. What it was that happened was something horrible had happened at the White House, and she had called us in to consult. So I got an unscripted line in, uh, which was as we sit down with her, I said, isn't it great when the current Secretary of State calls her predecessors in to consult? We used to do that all the time. And they left it in. Oh, that's great. But you know, the, the, it comes across how much you, you, you enjoyed it and how much you enjoy humor, which is why on Trevor Noah, I was so just mesmerized by the idea of the part humor might play in diplomacy. Um, last question for me. I can't leave you without knowing about the pin you're wearing today, being famous for pins as you are. Well, I'm, I'm glad you asked it. I'll tell you, it has, when I write in my book um, that um, I spent World War II in London during the Blitz with my parents, my father was um, a Czechoslovak diplomat, and he uh, was in London working with the government in exile. And his job was to broadcast uh, over BBC into Czechoslovakia. <clears throat> and I would listen to BBC. I, and I was so little, I actually thought he was inside the radio. But what happened was BBC introduced every show with kettle drums with the first five notes of Beethoven's fifth, da 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 doom, which in Morse code is V for victory, which is why I decided to wear this V pin. Um, and uh, it works for the book, but um, it now works for victory over the virus. But um, I love giving messages with my pins, and that has been one of the fun parts of my uh, attempt at humor uh, as I meet with a variety of leaders because they have figured out what it is I'm saying with my pins. Wow. Madam Secretary, thank you for the book. Personally, I found it intriguing. I have a thousand notes. Thank you for your service to our country. We're a better place because you're in it. And thank you for taking the time this morning, Madam Secretary. It was my honor. It's my honor to talk with you. Thank you so very much for your excellent questions. Thank you. You're welcome. And thank you to the Washington Speakers Bureau for making this possible. And I appreciate all of what you've done, Madam Secretary. Hope to see you again. I hope so. Great. Thanks.